incredibly useful. Back to the overworld. Paint the obsidian there. Uh, OCD texture pack HUD icons because I prefer those to like the stupid little hearts. Uh, turn. Put those away. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I've done? I went through a whole lot more Miscraft ages, half of which were total disasters, including one, I don't remember what it was called, it was basically a big uh, field of pink uh, flux goo, like the, from Thumbcraft. I had to go into Peaceful to get out of that world simply because, well, so many slimes spawned at the frame rate was terrible. Actually, something similar happened in this world, not this world, but its original clone. Create an ocean abyss biome. The first time around, I got unlucky enough to have it be pink slime. So there's meat slimes everywhere. And, well, the framework that was so bad, it took me six minutes for the slash TPX zero command to go through. But here, well, it's liquid uh, mob essence, which is well overpowered, but I don't plan on exploiting it. The reason I wanted an ocean abyss biome, or any ocean biome really, is for this stuff. Railcraft Abyssal Stone. That is something I find quite a nice building material. And, well, that's what I've done here. Also, side note, this is another one of those ages where only Endermen and Slime spawn. I don't know how that happens. I've looked in the Miscraft code. I don't see anything like that. I don't see any pages that do that. But apparently some ages only have Endermen and Slime spawn. And that's quite nice. Pretty much all the ages I've made extensive use of have been like that. Or just Rainbow Forest, which have nothing at all except tiny slimes and animals. Okay. I haven't changed anything. I don't think I've even visited the end since I recorded the video, so I'm not going to go there. There's there's no, no point. Um, I haven't made major changes beyond the house, or far away from the house, cause, so because there's also no point. I don't ever go over there. I did do one thing. I'll show you in a second. But, oh, that night vision effect is getting annoying. One thing I did is near spawn is... Oh, side note, these are great wood planks. The, I brought back the old Magic Bees style texture. Like, Magic Bees used to add great wood planks until Thomcraft added its own great wood planks, but I think Thomcraft's or default textures for great wood planks don't look very nice. So I brought back the Magic Bees texture for the Thomcraft great wood planks. Again, my texture pack. Anyway, let's go over to spawn. There goes the night vision starting to fade. Oh yeah, I drained up all this liquid ender around here. Yeah, I've got like 900 buckets of liquid ender in the ME system now. So I can make all the test tracks I could ever want. Not that I plan on making a lot of them. Yeah, I'll run all these mobs, which is kind of satisfying. Although even if you don't want to let it hit me, so what? It knocks me around. And yeah, I've got mob creeping off, so even if I get face-to-face -face with a creeper, it doesn't matter. And yes, this is how I like it. I don't play um, Minecraft or, for that matter, any other game to be stressed out and, you know, oh my god, I just died again. I, I hate that. I play to, well, do what you see me doing up in that house, that sort of thing. I play to have fun. I think you can probably see that in the design of Rotorcraft and Reactorcraft, that once you've got enough ability, enough power, the game's pretty much easy mode for you. Well, okay, I'm playing on easy mode, but pretty much you're a god. That's exactly how I like it. Yeah, my efforts trying to cut down a rainbow tree with uh, the Tinker's Concert Lumbrax, not very effective. Or, not rainbow tree, se sequoia tree. The bedrock uh, axe can do a better job of it. In fact, I'm going to do that right now just to clean this huge hole up. That's convenient. Let's go get rid of all this stuff. I wish to change the color channel of the boar's uh, ender chests. They're, it's kind of annoying to have them go through my normal ender pouch. Anyway, let's just okay, put all this stuff that's down here. Okay, just make sure there's nothing up here. I don't really mind having this giant thing of leaves up here. I mind a little, but not that much. But anyway, the reason I went here... Back down below the clouds. I don't know why my frame rate's going bad, but okay. It is over here just to show you something I didn't show you. This is actually the, the true spawn of the world right in this jungle biome over here. Somewhere in this edge area. Through here, over here, right there where I 
this hole is. So on this, that little ridge right here. I don't know why the frame is so bad. Anyway, spawn is right about here. And, well, I got irritated with having to always, if I had to, like, TPX zero or something, ending up surrounded by trees and able to, unable to get out. Plus, if it was night, you know, there'd be mobs everywhere. So I just decided to clear out some of the jungle. And I used the Bedrock Axe. What that then meant was it took off all those, it thought all those connected shrubs were one tree, and cleared off pretty much everything except the logs. So now we've got a field of jungle with logs everywhere. Lovely. But not a huge deal. Yeah, let's go back to the main the house again. biome discontinuity over there as a result of the Thawncraft installation. I just I mentioned that in the last video. You saw the discontinuity up by the swamp plant. Well, there's one over here too. Ty got a rainbow forest. And there's one off over that direction as well. There's a ravine down there. Uh, one off in that direction. It's a desert to extreme hills. Either way, it's ugly and nothing I can do about it, which pisses me off, but oh well. No, bien. Or derp. Uh, however you say that properly. Do not install a biome adding mod after generating a world. It just does not end well. I mean, it didn't corrupt it or anything, but it made all these giant cliffs. Good thing is, they're far enough away from my house that I don't actually ever see them unless I deliberately go up to, towards them. So, it's not too big a deal. Well, I'm kind of curious, though, why I'm seeing artifice plants here. Considering I generated this long for installed artifice, I guess it's got some sort of retrogen. Sheep enjoying the teleportation ability of Liquid Ender. Anyway, I don't know what this big rectangle of sand is for. It's just weird natural generation, I guess. Speaking of sand, I should probably make this this thing have sand at the bottom. It would look better than it currently does. But anyway. By the way, I'll explain the function of shaft power buses because people have been failing to understand that. The way it works is you put power in the controller here. And yes, it needs lubricant too, as you can see. You put power in the controller here, and then you place p bus pieces, and you have to start connected to the controller. And then, so I place this one, and then this one, and then this one, and so on. I can't say place this, and then this, and then, you know, work my way back, or I can't place all these, and then the controller. It has to be controller first, and then every piece you add on must be connected, possibly indirectly through other buses, to the shaft power bus controller. And then it just, basically it acts like a multi-directional shaft. So what I've done is every single piece has a shaft unit in its yellow side. The yellow side, as you can't tell, is facing the fans. Well, um, that means every fan is receiving, or it thinks every fan is like a one-to-one -one, uh, shaft. So it delivers power evenly among every single fan. And equal, these three yellow sides don't have shafts in them, obviously. Um, so we've got nine fans here, nine fans there, so 18 fans. So we're splitting power among 18 devices. Although, client side, this says it's being split to one devices because client side is a derp. Anyway, yeah, that's all Layla tooltips, of course. Not much else over here. Um, I did discover one interesting little thing. If you go down, I remember I, I mentioned there's a lava ravine here in the last video watch. We'll go down here now. This is where I drew most of my lava until I had a steady nether pump. But there's a funny little thing. I'm not actually lava proof right now, so let's see if this works. But no, we can't do it right now. But um, normally, if I had fire resistance on me, I could actually, you can see those dark craft, like, sprint, liquid sprint particles coming on. Let's get out of here. You can actually sprint across the surface of lava, the same way you can sprint across the surface of water. And the only reason I'm falling in is because I'm constantly taking damage. Let's see, it works for a second until I take damage. But oh well. I think that says something too, I can just casually run in lava without even caring. But anyway, 3D ores, I did those textures. Cobblestone, I don't remember where I found that. Um, I should probably clean up that piece of firestone ore over here. Okay, you know, I'll do that some other time. Multiple pieces of firestone. Those little cobble towers are just so I could uh, 
effectively clean up. Those were well, those are remnants from meteors. Back early on, I had meteor crap installed in this world, and well, meteors just rained ore everywhere. That's the remnant. There's still pieces of firestone here and there. I basically didn't move them because they were well, they burned down everything if you move them. Well, that's why. Until I had the ender pouch, it wasn't effective because I'd have to run around with firestone ore on me. But anyway, oh by the way, there's a just an interesting thing. If I go over to this part of the world, there's nothing un unusual over here. But if I go over here and start loading a chunk that's presumably at the render distance now, you'll notice the frame rate is now one frame a second. And there is nothing unusual in the console logs. So it's it's not like a, a monster running exception, it's just the frame rate goes very, very poor. Uh, it's so bad you can't open Opus while it's here. So I've got no idea what's doing it. But if anyone else has any ideas what might cause a chunk to do that, we greatly appreciate it. I know we're out of that area now. So it's, it's kind of irritating to have a significant size area of the world nearly inaccessible. There's nothing important over there. The only thing I've ever done over there is mine up and build craft oil. Uh, there, was a, there was a big oil well over there in the desert. That's it. Well, that looks interesting, doesn't it? Anyway. Um, close up, look at Guardian Stone. Or these little particles actually all fall in Keplerian orbits. Like I actually coded them in as having you know, certain inclinations and arguments of perigee, that sort of thing. And they all have their own unique properties. They're not actually the one thing they're not doing legitimately though is th the angular rate's the same no matter what, which is not actually the case with Keplerian orbits. They have a high, higher angular rate when they're closer to their their focal point. They're... But that's okay. Anyway, uh, I don't believe there's anything else. I don't think there's anything else I've done. More white lines from the enemy system. That's really cool looking. So yeah, that's pretty much all the new stuff in this world. Hasn't changed that much, I don't think, but oh well. So, so, like the last video, this shows people, you know, stuff you can do with the various mods and the way they interact. And also stuff you can do to get around the nerfs and the magnetostatics, sort of. I haven't really explained how the magnetostatics setup works. Now there's there's upgrades. I'll, I'll up, pull up an... Uh, there's a bunch of upgrades for magnetostatics. There's a, if you make a magnetostatic straight from the crafting recipe, let's just dump all this stuff, you get a tier zero. And you can see... Torque 8 new meters, max speed 256 rads, and that's max power of 2 kilowatts. Well, that's pretty much pitiful. That's. That's nothing. So, you need an upgrade 1. So, if I take an upgrade 1, and right now they don't stack, but I'm going to make them do that. Right click, eats it. Now it's 32 new meters, and it lets me put up to 512, so 16 kilowatts. Better. Next upgrade. Uh, is tier 2 upgrade. This one needs to be magnetized, as you can see. I've got various magnetized ones here. Let's take that one. Use it again, and 128 newton meters and higher allowed speed, 331 kilowatts. Okay. Next upgrade is tier four, or no, tier three. I'll just pull up all the tiers. Tier five. Anyway, okay. So put on tier three upgrades. Eat it. 512 newton meters now by 2048, so a megawatt of power. Tier four upgrades, and 2048 newton meters, 4096 rounds, so eight megawatts. So this is slightly more, uh, twice as powerful as the original pre-change version, but the post-nerf version. Anyway, put the next one on, 8192 newton meters, 8192 rads. And these are the ones I'm using, like, for here, for example, or on the centrifuges, or on the bores, anyway. And this is the most powerful one. This is as powerful as a jet engine in terms of raw power output. It doesn't put it at the same kind of speed, though. So I must admit, though, there's, like, it's hard to equal the... the convenience of just carrying around power as RF. But anyways, that's how you upgrade the magnetostatics. The way you make the upgrades is fairly straightforward. Um, if I've set it to gate it based on how far you've made an aircraft. The problem I had, I was, I was looking at you know, various YouTube videos, and pretty much everybody who uses aircraft, if they weren't one of the, you know, the core people who've been using it for a long time, they use it for two things, the battery breaker and the extractor, and that is it. And very frequently, the battery breaker was the first machine they ran. 
And the way they did that was with, well, originally one magnetostatic, and then v V16 came out and nerfed that, so they just used four magnetostatics. That's not any better. So what I did now is make it basically gated on how far you've progressed in Rotorcraft. So the tier one upgrade requires a little bit of ethanol. So to get ethanol, of course, you need a fermenter, and that means you need some basic power supply and, well, no, know how to use that. Tier two, well, it's just requires items to make, but you need to magnetize. I mean, you need a functioning uh, magnetizing unit and enough power to run that, so 16 kilowatts. Tier 3, you need the inductive ingot, which can only be made in the pulse jet furnace from the inductive metal blend, which is just gold and redstone, gold dust and redstone dust or similar. But that means you need, well, a pulse jet furnace, and that means you need high speeds, you need uh, jet fuel, you need a uh, fractionator. You need to have made it pretty far in rotorcraft for that. Tier 4, you need to make uh, use tungsten. Tungsten is made by smelting tungsten flakes. You notice you need a friction heater to get that. It's a furnace recipe, yes, but it can only happen in a, a, a furnace that's run by a furnace heater, or run by a friction heater, and at sufficiently high temperature, and that requires about 16 or so megawatts of power to get that high. So it means you need to be able to generate that much rotorcraft power, and this is more than you can currently generate before you've achieved this with your first magnetostatic, so you need to have done that. Tungsten flakes are they're a bonus from processing redstone ore in the extractor. I know you need silk touch to get that, and I'm, I might be changing that. I don't know. But the reason I chose redstone is because redstone is, I assumed, you know, somewhat ferromagnetic in nature. So tungsten is probably going to be somewhat similar chemically. Anyway, and then the tier 5 upgrade, not surprisingly, just needs bedrock. So you need the functioning bedrock breaker. So the way I've got this all set up, then, it means basically by the time you can make one of these upgrades, you can already generate more power using the actual proper rotary craft way instead. So, you know, 2 kilowatts, you already need to be able to produce, uh, well, ethanol, so it means you can already produce 65 kilowatts. And then for the next one, 131 kilowatts, you need to already be, you can already run uh, the AC engines, that's 131 kilowatts. And then the next one after that, you need, um, it can produce 1 megawatt on that magnetostatic, but you need the ability to produce rather more than that because you're running jet fuel. And the one after that is, well, you need you need about 16 megawatts of power. You can only produce eight. And then the one after that, well, it's the final tier. Anyways, just to show you why I've got all those boring machines set up. Ingot. Remember, previously it was just a few hundred thousand of this stuff. Well, now we've got a million iron, 400k gold, 3 million copper, a little over 3 million, 3 million tin, a whole lot of other stuff, including, amusingly, 130,000 platinum, 4,000 iridium, I'm not sure what good iridium is actually for, despite people saying always oh, supposed to be the rarest metal in the game, well, it doesn't seem all that useful, and there's a whole lot of everything else. The only thing I don't have a lot of is, well, endarium and thomium, which I don't have much use for. But I could make more of these if I so desired. Anyway, um, that's pretty much the survival world and the changes that have been made and how I've adapted to them. I don't know why there's so many pages in this uh, ME system. That's going to be filling up a lot of empty slots. Uh, lots of nuclear fuel in here, apparently. Lots of schematics. I should probably clean those out because they're just wasting types in here. Oh, and yeah, I've... Oh, I must admit, I've been... I've not been very uh, honest. I've been storing mine in my ME system. I'm actually toying with the idea of making them short out something in the enemy system, like you know, burn out an item on a drive or something. I don't know if that's possible, and I don't know if that's something I would get into trouble for doing. So I'm not really like planning on doing it. Just it's kind of an interesting idea that I've toyed with. But anyways, it's all the various things we've got in here. Lots and lots and lots and lots of things. So that's that's this world. That's hopefully going to provide some inspiration to people, so they can get ideas what to do and show them how to, what the next steps might be, to, uh, how to adapt. Because a lot of people have been saying, you know, once the magnetostatics got nerfed, well, rotocraft's now too hard to use. Well, quite obviously not. You just need to know what you're doing. It's not that expensive. Res it's the same as before. It's not that expensive resource-wise. It's just generating the power requires a lot of know-how. Once you know how to do it, it's 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 not that bad. Unless you're one of those guys who's like, oh my, oh my god, what does this mean? What does, you know, what's a newton meter? How do I turn two into four? That sort of thing. If you're one of those people, then, well, good luck. But most people, I would hope, are smart enough to get around that. So anyways, um, hope you enjoyed the video, and let's...
Hope you get something out of it.